Thanks so much, Kelly. And thank you for a wonderful paper, Yasmina. Uh, I'm going to try and follow that one. Um, if you just bear with me for a moment, I'm just going to share my screen. Yes, thank you very much. And then I'll properly introduce you. Okay, well, let me just get my, yeah, there. let me just get the presentation up. Just hold on a moment. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Lovely. All right. Okay. I'm all set to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, our second speaker is Dr. Dia Gupta, who is a past and present fellow in race, ethnicity, and equality in history. Um, she was education at Jadavpur University, Kolkata, India, at the University of Cambridge and King's College London. Um, she's a literary and cultural historian interested in the intersections between life writing, visual culture, and literature, particularly in response to war. And today her paper is entitled Unmaking and Remaking, Imagined Male Communities in Indian Second World War Prisoner of War Narratives. Dia, please share with us. Okay, thanks so much for that, Kelly. Um, that gives plenty of context, I think, to my own research. Uh, just to say that I finished my PhD in, in 2019. And what I'm going to present for you today forms part of a chapter of the book that I'm now writing that's coming out of the PhD research. Uh, and it's due at the end of this year, the manuscript. So wish me luck. Um, I need to get cracking with the writing. Um, yeah, so, so just to, to share with you how I am thinking through ideas of um, both prisoner of war narratives, but also male friendships and fellow feeling in these narratives. Okay, so. So the Indian prisoner of war experience in the Second World War is pretty much um, what we might call in, in today's language, a hidden history. If you think about the Indian experience itself in the Second World War, it's not really been studied very much. Um, and that's partly why I undertook my PhD uh, research on this topic. So a very brief, brief background of the sorts of numbers involved. In the Second World War, two and a half million men from undivided India, so that's modern day India, Bangladesh and Pakistan, served the British uh, in the Second World War. Um, and of course, the war ends in 1945. Uh, the subcontinent is, uh, gets independence in 1947. And we have the the trauma of partition and uh, the new countries of India and Pakistan coming out of that. So in, in the midst of this hidden, hidden history, if you like, there is a double layer of, of forgetting, and that is those Indian men who were taken prisoner of war. And possibly the most sort of famous prisoner of, uh, of war experience we can think of with regards to India and the Second World War is the Indian National Army, which was uh, led by uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose, the political radical, who, um, uh, who fought for a, a, a militant protest against uh, British colonialism in India and uh, joined up with Japanese forces uh, recruited men from prisoner of war camps uh, and formed this army that fought with the Japanese um, against the allied forces. The army lost, by the way. So, um, but what happened to those men who didn't form part of this Indian National Army? This is what the, the paper explores. By the way, I think I was far too ambitious in saying I'm going to discuss narratives. This is a short paper. I will discuss one narrative and give you a bit of context. So, so as you can see sort of from the bullet points on the slide, um, the prisoner of war experience um, of Indian soldiers varied sharply. It depended really on where one was taken captive and on who one's captor was. So by the end of the war, about 200,000 British and Empire troops were imprisoned in prisoner of war camps in Germany out of a total of 2 million allied prisoners of war. On the other side, Japan's rapid occupation of British-owned territory in Southeast Asia between December 1941 and March 1942 saw more than 180,000 Allied troops, and these of course included colonial forces that, who were taken captive. 
So although the precise numbers of Indian prisoners of war in Europe and in East Asia are not always easy to determine, recent research has suggested that about 15,000 Indian prisoners of war were in German and Italian custody, while over 60,000 Indian troops were captured in Singapore by the Japanese. Now this contrast of what sort of treatment they were meted out and what sort of experiences they had was not simply one of numbers. The two fronts saw very different uh, treatments of prisoners as well. So if you consider sort of Indian officers who might have been imprisoned in Europe, and there are a few memoirs of Indian officers to whom this happened, they were spared um, the rigors of labor in the camps and they led confined, but I would say on the whole fairly comfortable lives. On the other hand, Japanese prisoner of war camps uh, were administered in decentralized and quite disparate ways. Those imprisoned in these Japanese prisoner of war camps included allied servicemen, non-combatant Europeans like colonial officials, businessmen and their families, and thousands of Chinese and Southeast Asian civilians who were forced into slave work. Um, as we all probably know, Japan had not signed the 1929 Geneva Convention, but in 1942, it agreed to abide by the spirit of the convention's terms, but often in practice, this was not followed. The camp locations could range from Japan itself to Burmese jungle interiors, and incarceration could mean solitary confinement in secret police jails. It could mean hard labor, manual labor in working groups, or it could mean accommodation in large structured camp communities, such as that of Changi in Singapore. And in the image here, you see um, a group of men in the British Indian Army who are uh, having a meal of beans and uh, curry and chapatis. Uh, sorry, yeah. So before I talk a bit about um, the male, friendship, male friendships that were established in these incarcerated conditions, I thought I'd give you a really whistle-stop tour of what, what masculinity and male friendships um, derived from historically. So male connections in Indian prisoner of war memoirs draw upon quite established Indian traditions of martial comradeship and fellow feeling, as well as long-standing anxieties regarding the nature of what colonial masculinity was. So the scholar uh, Mrilalini Sinha in her influential study uh, examines the constructs of, I'm quoting, the manly Englishman and the effeminate Bengali in the 19th century. And she highlights the influences of race and imperialism in these constructs. And then if we look perhaps at the, at the work of someone like Rosalind O'Hanlon, who extends Miranini Sinha's argument of colonial masculinity to older Indian practices, she shows us how the circulation of military uh, identities during the 18th century amongst ethnic groups like the Rajputs, the Marathas, the Sikhs and the Afghans, who formed part of the North Indian military labor contingent and provided uh, service to Mughal armies long before they were recruited by the British. And they formed what she has called peasant brotherhood in arms. And they adhered to these shared codes of martial masculinity that promoted intercommunal fellow feeling. So male comradeship then stems from this well, well established trajectory in Indian military history. But I argue that it's really with the world wars, both world wars and especially the second world war, that such fellow feeling gains a transnational scope and it seeks to challenge political structures. Okay, so moving on now to the particular narrative I'd, I'd like to discuss. Um, this is uh, an Indian prisoner of war memoir that was um, written by somebody who wasn't an elite officer. He occupied quite a junior officer rank in the army um, and he was taken captive by the Japanese um, uh, in Singapore uh, with the fall of Singapore. Um, and he writes in English, his, his background is that he was um, uh, Catholic by, uh, by faith, 
and and uh, his memoir wasn't very much available at all uh, until recently. And there's a really fascinating history behind the publishing of this memoir in the first place. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the photograph, if you can uh, see the PowerPoint here, is uh, him being awarded a medal after he was um, uh, rescued from the prisoner of war camp at the end of the war. So on, on Christmas Eve 1945, the 35-year-old John Baptist Custer, who you can see having the medal pinned on him here, serving in the British Indian Army, returned home to India after four years away in Southeast Asia. And he had spent three and a half years of this time as a prisoner of war under the Japanese. So when he returned to India, he was terribly weak and ill, and he needed six months sick leave to recuperate with his mother nursing him. It was during this time that he scribbled in pencil on the yellowing stationery of his brother's shoe store in south, southwestern India, an account of his imprisonment. After, after India's independence, Krasta continued to work for the, British, for the Indian Army at that point as a subedar major or junior officer. His manuscript, which had no title or even chapter divisions, lay forgotten for 51 years until it was recovered from an old trunk somewhere and published as a surprise for him by his son in 1997. And this was only two years before Craster himself died. And it was Craster's son who gave the memoir this, this title, Eaten by the Jap Japanese. It's not a literal eating at all. Um, it's used metaphorically, the title, to signal his father's intense suffering as a prisoner of war in Southeast Asia. So if, if the sort of Pacific War itself has been overshadowed in modern memory by the Normandy landings and by Allied victory in Europe, John Baptist Craster's slim 80-page memoir stands at the crossroads, I say, of a double forgetting. Memoirs such as The Railway Man, which was published in 1995 by British writer Eric Lomax, representing Lomax's prisoner of war experiences after the Japanese takeover of Singapore and documenting his forced labor on the infamous Burma Siam Railway have had some purchase on public memory, I think, particularly in the West. But as I was saying before, the non-INA, non-Indian National Army, uh, Indian experiences under the Japanese has been almost entirely erased, both in modern South Asia as well as in the West. So Craster's memoir, for lots of reasons then, is really significant because it's one of the first few um, first-hand Indian records of the Allied forces' overwhelming surrender to Japan in February 1942, the formation of the INA uh, under Shubhash Chandra Bose, and in terms of political affiliation, we, we come to understand that Krasta utterly rejects the Japanese. Um, he wants to have nothing whatsoever to do with them. He doesn't want to defect to them. And along with that, he doesn't want to have anything to do with the INA either. But his emotional responses towards his fellow prisoners of war, as well as very interestingly with certain Japanese captors highlight how unstable these political divisions really are and, and how unpredictable his own inner world really is. So I want to touch a little bit about the sorts of connections that Krasta forges across ethnic differences. Um, so in the memoir, and, and to just a brief comment on the memoir style, he's not, um, he's not a particularly verbose writer. Krasta. His, his style is quite dry and spare and sparse, and uh, he, he, he doesn't at all make much of how much he suffers, but because he writes so little about it, it, it takes on a particular sort of poignancy. So he shipped out, we understand from the memoir, in April 1943 with other Indian prisoners of war to an unknown destination, which finally turns out to be the Japanese occupied island of New Britain in modern Papua New Guinea. And the memoir is infused with memories uh, of comradeship. And you'll see some of these in the, in the quotes that I've put up um, in the slide for you. So, so some of these initial connections are made with other Indian prisoners of war. So, so Krasta writes, Harbans Lal, Sen Gupta and I had been talking till late that night 
planning our post-war schemes. And now my only friends there were no more. So what had happened was that Harbans Lal Sen Gupta uh, had been killed by uh, an air raid, whereas Krasta hadn't. And so he says, I could not restrain myself and tears rolled down my cheeks. So this is our first sort of intimation of a male community that had been created as a product of war and that had dreamt together of freedom beyond the conditions of incarceration. And it was this sharing of this dream, I think, that made such hopeful imaginings possible in the first place. And these male communities we find in the memoir continue to be made and remade. And at points it even transformed in, transforms into a ledger of gratitude to friendship. So Craster, for example, recalls his Christmas dinner, bearing in mind that he came from the Christian faith. So this was important to him. Uh, his Christmas dinner in December, 1944. And he says, I wish to record the names of the people who gave me considerable help as regards food, vegetables, and so forth during these months. And he talks about prisoners of war, Suraj Din, Franors, Giat, and Ramaswamy. And th that's it, there's no other mention of them. Their only trace of existence in the memoir is in this brief note on a Christmas meal they once shared with Krasta. And it highlights for me how Krasta uses writing as a means of preserving the memory of their names. And though the food for this Christmas meal is very meager, the formation of this community and the enjoyment of companionship um, over this special meal becomes particularly emotionally significant. And this forges the way for the memoir to reveal Krasta's intimate relationships with other Indian prisoners of war, this time people with whom he has very little in common, and yet who look after him with tenderness when he is most vulnerable. And this is the last sort of quote that's up there um, in the PowerPoint. Craster tells us of the affection with which he is nursed in the summer of 1945 when he falls seriously ill. And he says, during these months, Rup Lal and Lance Naik uh, Mohant Ram of 22 Battalion were of great help to me. Rup Lal and I ate together and he shared with me whatever he could manage to get. Mohant Ram stitched our torn clothes and even washed them, something no one would have done in the circumstances. I did not belong to their unit. Yet they, realizing my helpless condition, did what they could to make me comfortable. During my illness and anxiety, Rup Lal comforted me and was my constant companion. I can never forget these two gentlemen as long as I live, and I pray to God that he may amply reward them. So if we look, for example, at um, literary, sco literary scholars and historians like Riv Kazim, um, who, who talk about prison writing, she, she writes about European prison writing in her, in her book, The Consolations of Writing. And for Rivka Zim, prison writing reveals the importance of the life of the mind. I'm quoting her here. Produced from situations of captivity, confinement, and persecution. But I argue that in Indian prisoner of war accounts of the Second World War, they reveal the significance of the life of the emotions. For it is by such acts of nurturing under conditions of extreme duress simply to keep each other alive, that Krasta and his fellow prisoners of war become allies in the fight against institutionalized suffering. And my final slide is really to talk about how Krasta sees male connections being forged even across enemy lines with the Japanese themselves. And just to sort of preface this, um, as you can see from the, from the, the picture on the PowerPoint, um, prisoners of war faced acute conditions of starvation, hard manual labor, deprivation, and there is plenty of that in the memoir. So Krasta does not play down whatsoever um, the treatment he gets at the hands of his Japanese captors. And yet it's remarkable to me that he does not see um, all the Japanese as the same, as it were. He, he notices and particularly comments upon people with whom he's able to build a relationship, even though technically they're, they're categorized as the enemy. So he notes, for example, how a Japanese captor called Harai Jotuhoi, 
who is in charge of their particular prisoner of war group was, I quote, the kindest of all the Japanese I had met. He was a young fellow, hardly 30 years old, good natured and considerate. And this was because um, Harai had consigned Krasta and other Indian prisoners of war only to several hours of light garden work near the Japanese headquarters. Krasta also remembers other Japanese officers working in this same garden as having, I quote, a kind word for us, which was very much appreciated. And then he goes on to describe the sort of emotional nourishment he believes that Indian prisoners of war needed from their captors, and I quote, a few kind words and courteous treatment, and he, that is an Indian prisoner of war, is quite satisfied. He is sentimental. Krasta's repetition of the word kind here in this context is particularly significant. Although these are, of course, contingent moments of connection, rather than the development of a sustained homosocial bond, they punctuate the ordeal of his prison experience with intimacy, warmth, and humanity. And as I mentioned before, um, Rivka Zim's work on the consolations of writing, she focuses on the same word while discussing, for example, Primo Levi's emphasis on kindness to strangers, those he calls who are different from ourselves. And Rivka Zim declares, without that kindness, we are not human beings. And I think in Krasta's case, the word kind becomes particularly emotionally re resonant because it expands in meaning. And it becomes this expansive feeling that responds to another's distress, no matter who they might be. And again, so Krasta moves on to a, another Japanese sergeant whose name's Mina Gunso. And he talks about him as well with considerable feeling. And this is uh, another quote on the PowerPoint. He knew how, when, and to whom to be lenient. He had a fair education, knew a smattering of English, and had a liking for India. It is this good Mina, within quotes, as Krasta fondly calls him, who tells the Indian prisoners of war on 16th August 1945 that peace had been declared. And he follows this up by saying to Krasta, that he wished to accompany the prisoners of war to India, where he would be happy to undertake any sort of work. So this is, this is quite a, a strange reaction from someone who was, you know, technically in the category of enemy talking to you. Um, and in, in some ways, I feel that they, they, their friendship is, is formulated around a version of pan-Asian solidarity. Um, there's definitely um, liking and reciprocity there. And in fact, Custer's son, Richard, who um, has published the memoir, gives it its title uh, and annotates and edits the memoir, notes at this point that his father later named his only daughter, Mina, and that she turned out to, hit, to be his most beloved child. And we're not told ultimately what becomes of the, the good Mina, the good Japanese, except that he lingers on as this emotional trace in Custer's post-war life. So this word kind then that repeatedly comes through in the memoir, um, I would argue is developed against a structure of vertical relationships built on racial and colonial hierarchies. So the word kind rep represents, if you think of the verticality of these sort of hierarchical relationships of power, the word kind represents sort of lateral movement um, that's kind of pushing against these vertical hierarchical connections. It's a lateral movement that's connecting and uniting by unmaking the structures that separate and stratify. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, Dia, thank you very much for that really charming and I think illuminating discussion of how masculinity works in this context. And I have to say that um, having written about masculinity in the past, I don't think I had much aware of awareness of this whole category that you're now exploring. So I'm gonna invite everybody to come back to life <clears throat> if you can. And um, let's uh, tell Dia how much we do appreciate her if you'd like to give her a bit of uh, applause there. That would be lovely. And um, give her a moment to breathe uh, while we get ready to pummel her with uh, questions.
no, well, that's not what we're going to do. But um, I'd just like to start off by asking about um, this, the um, Krasta um, uh, memoir is, is, is incredibly powerful as you, you brought out of it. And possibly, as you say, from the kind of compactness and the kind of muscularity perhaps of the writing that it goes against the grain sometimes in this emphasis on kindness to other people at a time when people are so vulnerable because he's talking about vulnerability here. And this is a hard thing to fit into our ideas about masculinity a lot of the time. It, it's kind of counterintuitive. But I was rather wondering um, about Craster himself. He's clearly very young. He is, I guess he's a career soldier or thinking about this. And uh, that, and he's a junior officer, but who would have hoped to proceed um, in, in his career, I suppose. And I was wondering how much his age, not so much his rank, but his, his youth had an impact on the way he saw these relationships with other men and looking after um, younger people and older people looking after him or respect for elders perhaps at one time. And also the kind of feeling that we often get when people talk about masculinity, about soldiers respecting the enemy and trying to find some sort of humanity there at the same time that they're having to fight them. So can you talk about any of these bits in the narratives that you've been looking at, perhaps reaching beyond Krasta? Sure, that's a great quest question, Kelly, thank you. So just to first say that Krasta is not as young as we might suppose, he's 35 years old. So, so see, he's not in his 20s. So, and his writing is, so I've read quite a few of these memoirs and the writing style, this is fascinating to me as a literary scholar, varies dramatically. And Krasta is not, um, not a romantic in any sense of the word. He's a, he's a very, um, he looks at the world in a very unsentimental, dry way. And that's how he writes, which is why I think he never, he's never effusive at all um, in the way he discusses emotions. So therefore particular words like kind or good take on a special resonances. Um, so, so yeah, so I think he is, it's not it's not a youthful understanding of of male relationships but you are right in that he does go on to become a career soldier um he always seems to stay at the rank of about junior officer though um and it's also interesting to note that he never talks about his experiences so this is the other strange bit um in the whole writing of the memoir and publishing of it his son never knows about this memoir whatsoever till he comes across it so it's like he he suffers this ordeal. He goes. He is in this prisoner of war camp. He comes back home. He writes it and he forgets about it, and it's it's never talked about again. Um, in some of the other memoirs I've looked at, so there's a really interesting memoir um, written by an Indian officer who was uh, taken prisoner of war uh, in Italy. And again, the the it, 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 you know these are spaces also that are very very male centered. So. Uh, bonds develop very quickly between between men and there's a whole there's a whole sort of idealized um, representation of uh, an Italian soldier who is helping him uh, but the language of that is completely different um, so so and and in fact in my chapter I study them as as contrasts to each other mm. I hope that I hope that kind of answers your question uh, that that's very good. Although I would like to say about him not talking about it, just because he didn't talk to his children about it, doesn't mean that he didn't talk to his fellow soldiers about experiences. Because in sure. other countries, there's a lot of evidence that these narratives just do not get shared within the family sure. so much as they do with other old soldiers who sure. um, e even these difficult things. So anyway, um, if other people have questions, I see Somak is. Uh, just raised his. Oh, he's raised a thumb. He's raised the thumb rather than uh, than a, a question. So I don't know. So Mike, do you have a question though? Yes, please unmute. Go. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, the thumb raise is also to say that it's a really good presentation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought that's what it meant. But hey, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Uh, really great presentation. Yeah. So uh, very quickly. I have one of those uh, questions that has some parts in it. It basically is a way of saying it's a two, three part question. 
Uh, yeah, so, so let me get my pen out then, Shomak, to write down uh, your parts. Okay, go. Okay, but do tell if it's too much. Um, okay, I'm just gonna fine. power it up. Yeah, so uh, yeah, because it's a very rich kind of some many points is trying to like straddle. So I'm just gonna begin with the whole uh, point about pan Asianism, which you say it. So, so, so pan Asianism sort of emerged as this sort of uh, sort of like you know, this sort of fertile ground for a lot of anti British solidarities, right? And uh, often involving involving the high cultural imaginaries of Asian elites, but particularly India, Japan, Sri Lanka in particular, right? Particularly Hindu Buddhist civilization, a kind of connection. And I was wondering how much is it actually a subaltern project then, right? So mm. for it to percolate down to the lower cultural mm. imaginaries to be actually applicable to soldier kind of uh, solidarities, right? So that's mm. one. And the second point is the sort of from Casta, it's the, uh, yeah, uh, it seems like he is some kind of Catholic uh, yeah, so, right, Catholic background, like an Indian Catholic kind of thing, yes. right? So, yeah, so I was wondering, given how complex um, uh, sort of processes of, processes of um, like, you know, um, sort of recruiting kind of military labor complex was within colonial India in both the wars, right? So there's clearly mm. a kind of caste class, mm. there's a whole mobilization of military mm. castes, and I was wondering, there's a lot of lower caste who convert to Catholicism, mm. but then try to reinvent themselves within that sort of martial caste class trope, and I was wondering how much is that, um, if, if you can frame casta's own kind of engagements through that, did mm. he actually face any kind of discrimination due to those differences in the army beforehand? Uh, yeah, that, and, and lastly is sort of uh, like, like, you know, as a, as, a, as a sort of war historian, we know very well that like you know, wars are like excellent places that blur kind of masculinity, right? You know, sort of in a, in a way sort of creates, as you said, homosociality. Mm. So, uh, so I was wondering what happens after the war, like, like mm. you know, wartime masculinities do not necessarily last in the same way, right? So how does mm. it get reinvented? That's all. Mm. Fantastic questions. Thank you. Great. Um, very pleased to try to answer all of them. The Pan-Asianism, Fantastic question. So as you say very much, this idea of um, coming together in sort of anti-Western or anti-British solidarity, there's a great book on it called, um, I forgot the name of the writer, um, called uh, The Anti-West, I think. Um, I, can, I can look it up for you. It's, it's really good. But as you rightly say, it is a very high culture project. Um, and how much it kind of percolates down to subaltern groups is really difficult to know. And it's difficult to know even I think in this case because Krasta is so reticent. But the fact that, you know, this Japanese sergeant uh, Mina is coming to Krasta to tell him of Indian independence, uh, to tell him the war has ended, you know, in not a, in not a kind of um, uh, uh, kind of doomsday way as then, you know, that's it, you know, we're, we're, we're done for, you know, you can go home now. But to say, you know, your home could possibly be my home too. You know, I could, I could go back to India. I quite like India. I'd like to look for work there. These sorts of, the ways in which this is sort of articulated seem to me to come from more than Krasta's, uh, sorry, more than the Japanese surgeon Mina's personal liking for Krasta. So there seems to be sort of the seeds, if you like, of some sort of idea of, of Pan-Asian solidarity to me there, even though you're absolutely right that this is a very, a, a very high culture project. Um, but it, it remains tentative. It remains that kind of in that sort of speculative space. There are suggestions of it, um, I think would be the way to, to frame it. Um, the recruitment question. Yeah, I didn't go into all of that. The recruitment is absolutely fascinating. Um, particularly in the Second World War, where um, I don't know how familiar everybody is with, is with this, but the British had very specific ideas of martial races um, amongst certain ethnic groups in India, and they were mostly from northern India. So the Rajputs, uh, the Punjabi Muslims, as they were called, um, uh, they, these sort of peasant warriors from northern India were seen as, as very martial. But in the Second World War, because the British need men so desperately, it completely breaks down. So um, Punjab still has the supplies the highest numbers of recruits, but this is very closely followed by Southern India. And Krasta, we remember, is coming from Southwest India. Um, so whether at all he faces discrimination because of, um, because of his religion, or perhaps if he had converted from a lower caste into Christianity, we just don't know. There's a lot we just don't know. Um, 
but certainly he is aware of these differences. So for example, in that, in that quote that I read out where these two men um, uh, look after him, two Indian men, he says very specifically, I was not of their unit. And actually the quote is longer. He says, I am not of their unit. I am not of their place and I'm not of their caste, but they still look after me. So, so as you rightly say, which is your sort of next question, war is blurring, blurring a lot of boundary lines that might have been much more uh, straightened in normal circumstances. Um, and, and therefore I call it unmaking and remaking. It's remaking a lot of connections simply because of the sorts of spaces it creates. And yes, the blurring absolutely that war creates as sites in which masculinity I think is reformed is, is critical to my project. It's very interesting to, to think about what might happen afterwards especially considering what we know of Indian history afterwards, um, the riots of 46, the communal violence of 47. Um, in some ways, perhaps some of these more um, so bonds of solidarity disintegrate in some way um, with partition and independence. And very, very sadly so. I think in 45, people have come back from the war men have come back from the war extremely empowered aware of their rights surviving this you know ordeal of six years but in many ways that dream is twisted and shattered by the time we get to 47. so i hope that i hope that sort of addresses it thank you your questions right that's very helpful i think but i think i'll, I'll point out one other thing about the japanese men that he was um dealing with there a lot of them are um, uh, recruited, uh, you know, they have to go serve. They're not military men of sure. choice. They're doing it. And there, there's a great, there's some evidence that many of them didn't want to be there. So it's an interesting thing to think about how they're, they're trying to deal with their own <coughs> masculinity. <coughs> Excuse me. Other questions? <coughs> not seeing any hands. Uh, and yet I'm sure that other people have things to, um, that they'd like to query you on. Anybody? Um, Joseph. Hi. Um, so um, thanks so much, Dia. That was that was amazing. Um, I I was just wondering. So you're you're in your broader project. You're using these kind of narratives um, a lot, presumably, to kind of construct or reconstruct some of the experiences of the um, Indian prisoners of war. Um, in different places, am I understanding that correctly? I, do, so I'm just thinking as a sort of matter of methodology, because at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned um, quite large numbers of um, Indian POWs. Um, I think you had like sort of 15,000 um, in, you know, German or Italian custody and 60,000 yeah. um, in, in, in Japanese um, camps. And so maybe it's a kind of... Uh, too simple a question, but how do you reconstruct those experiences? I mean, how, how do you go about doing that? And how, you know, how do you situate your um, extremely rich and interesting narratives that are presumably, you know, telling individual, um, personal, very personal, intimate experiences within the kind of broader context of, of a much larger number of men who are captured? And I, I guess, yeah, what are the challenges of doing that? I'd just be really interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Joseph. Um, it's it's a struggle. Um, so the sorts of history I do, which is very literary and cultural, um, particularly because I'm looking at sources that you know were hard to find and that need a lot of archival work to to kind of recover in the first place before I can study them, um, makes doing this sort of history a, a challenge certainly, and and especially if you think about the sorts of sources that do remain in archives. I mean, Craster is an exception. I think Craster has survived not only because his son went and published his his memoir, um, but because he writes in English, um, he is able to read and write. You know, there are um, Indian rates of literacy. Um, during the Second World War incredibly low amongst men. So not everybody is able to read and write at all. Um, I think they're as low as 14% um, amongst all the men by the, time that, by the time it's independence in 47, only 14% of, of men are literate. So, so you know, there are certain um, ways in which um, archives are constructed and I'm very well aware that I'm not going to be able to recover a large number of voices. Um, having said that though, for 
so I have one chapter that's on Indian prisoners of war. And what I'm trying to do there as much as possible um, is to look at um, the contextual background to some of the European uh, ways of treating prisoners of war, and then um, the Southeast Asian background to how prisoners of war were treated. And then I'm trying to locate the particular memoirs I found within those contexts. So, so it's very much, I would say, a historicized reading of particular works. And in no way am I saying that these are representative of, of all experiences at all. Um, they are particular um, versions of experiences that I'm trying to, to historicize and read against uh, the historical background. Um, so there's, there's, for example, the, the Indian officer's memoir I mentioned in, in Italy. Um, it's very, very different. It's called Whom Enemies Sheltered. And it's a, it's a very kind of lavish, um, romanticized, idealized uh, mode of writing where he's he's looking at uh, it's his first time to in Europe so th there's also that 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 sense of excitement and adventure in in seeing Europe for the first time even if it's under such circumstances but also because in Europe as an Indian officer he was spared hard labor so he is you know he is describes playing bridge with people he describes you know not having cigarettes for a day that's uh, you know a bit of a hardship but really, it's it's more a matter that his freedom is confined. It's not like he has actual physical hardship imposed upon him. But it's because his he he lives in the state of confinement that he then chooses to break free, and then he becomes a an escaped prisoner of war that the Germans and Germans are after at that point. So it's a really fascinating narrative. But Crasters is much more, and it's probably because of of the rank he occupies as well. It's much more resigned in tone. It has no grand ambitions whatsoever. He, he is not a, an elite Indian officer and doesn't expect to be treated that way. Um, so, so what I try to do is contextualize as much as possible uh, against the history that I, that I know in order to read these works. Interestingly, there are a few letters as well at the British Library of by Indian prisoners of war that are quite interesting to, to look at. I yeah. hope that sort of answers your question. Yeah, very much, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Who else would like to... Um engage. Oh, Noah, please unmute. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. Cool. So first of all, thank you for a, a tremendous paper. I'm um, two great papers today. This has been such a great seminar. Um, my question comes from a place of profound ignorance uh, as a, uh, as a medievalist, well out of my ballpark, but I was just wondering um, the kind of, uh, if 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 looking at this in like a, a broader context keeping in mind i also know nothing about the second world war really but but how would this compare to the kind of lived experiences of prisoners of war in other theaters um obviously the kind of you know racialized uh kind of context is 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 not really there but I, I'm, I'm thinking almost specifically kind of the way that u.s forces treated Nazi prisoners quite well uh, when African-American soldiers in the U.S. Army, um, you know, were, were kind of not. And that whole kind of context and and are these exceptional cases or or, or could you make a case that you're, you're speaking to a broader kind of lived experience in just a completely different context? Um, but either way, that was just a phenomenal paper. Thank you so much. Thanks, Noah. I think, you know, your question is just spot on, you know, you're, you're saying, so what were, were there racial dimensions to being treated as a, uh, an Indian prisoner of war? And absolutely, they, they were. Um, I, I would argue, though, it's not just the racial dimensions, it's also a matter of what rank you occupied. That was very important. So the, the Indian elite officer I mentioned who writes the memoir, uh, whom enemies sheltered, is treated quite well. I mean, he is in an Italian prisoner of war camp, but he's He's generally treated quite well, despite the fact that he is he is Indian. Um, but but Krasta, who is not, who is much lower down those those ranks, in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, is treated pretty badly. Um, that I think is quite um, I would say quite representative, since Japan didn't sign up to the the Geneva Convention, and we do have other memoirs. So I mentioned I think uh, the Railway Man by Eric Lomax. Um, uh, who uh, it, it's uh, a British experience of a, a Japanese prisoner of war camp who writes in very similar ways of the sorts of sort of slow deprivation that he faces. So in that sense, I don't think um, I don't think um, Krasta's memoir is unusual. Uh, 
in how it writes about, you know, physical deprivation. He even talks at times about, you know, wanting death. Well, why can't it just take me, for goodness sake? Why do I have to live through this? But what I found startling in it was the fact that perhaps in spite of the fact that there is so much physical hardship, he does not hate all Japanese and he can't bring himself to hate all Japanese, but he finds in weird ways that he's able to, to bond with some of them. And it's those bonds that I was interested in kind of unpicking further. So I hope that sort of answers your question to an extent. It, it does. Thank you so much. And I just think bringing all of this to light is just really just you're doing phenomenal work. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good to know. It's good to get some feedback. This is a, a, a fresh chapter I'm working on. So it's good to get feedback. Um, it, it also calls me to another question about the literary skills that you were talking about of uh, Krasta. Um, do, you, do you have, he was literate. Um, do you have any idea whether or not he read very much and was he um, influenced by um, the, the popular writers of the day? So for example, um, I'm a historian of a long time ago, of boys story papers and there were the equivalents in, in India. So did he read juvenile literature? Did he read the kind of uh, stuff of empire that we, we think about today as being so, so violently um, imperialist and racist that we can't really um, encourage people to read it? Did he read, was he aware of somebody like Hemingway who used that mm. kind of compressed language that you're talking about there, you know, the, the not showing too much emotion and yet they're crying and, you know, at, at, at it. So there, there's this tension within literature of the day, especially masculinity and, lit and literature in the wake of the First World War. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you have any feeling of his cultural influences beyond the army? Mm, it's a, again a fantastic question, um, Kelly. I, I think the repressed writing certainly has a history. Um, it's not coming out of nowhere. This is not just Krasta himself, but it's uh, himself writing in this particular mold. It's coming out of certain, I think, constructs of how uh, men are meant to face up to war and how they, even though they feel the great need to write about it, can only write about it in very kind of restrained ways. Mm -hmm. There is very little information on what he read, which is which is annoying. And he doesn't reference any of it in, in the memoir either. But the person who does reference it is the uh, elite Indian officer I keep talking about, the one who was in the Italian prisoner of war camp. And he loved his romance, uh, boyhood adventure stories. He was brought up on a lot of, you know, um, Victorian daring do tales. Um, interestingly, very few of the memoirs actually talk about Hitler or fascism or Nazism in any kind of way. It's, it's almost seen as, um, it's a bit of a, an absence that's conspicuous. So, so really, I think um, in a lot of ways, these men are signing up for jobs either because they have had martial history in their family and that's kind of what they're told to do and they, what they think they should be doing or because it's, uh, it was actively marketed in India at that point, signing up to the army as um, a job opportunity. So, you know, you learn a trade, you go into the army, you learn how to be an engineer. And in the post-war world, you know, you could use your engineering skills to get a good job. So it's, it's often sold to men in, in that particular way. Uh, but certainly the romance and adventure side of things in those imperial tales is much more evident in the, the, uh, the Indian elite officer who's imprisoned in Italy. That's not really very surprising at all, is it? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, because he would have had more of an elite education. Where exactly. Those things that's, were, were, that's exactly were available right. All the time. Right. That's Thank exactly you. right. And yeah. he, he's friends as well with a lot of British elite officers. So he's of a certain class and he's of a certain education. And that really comes out in his writing. Yeah. And I, I guess I should say that, of course, the um, boys' story papers of that period, often they, there were Indian figures within them mm. who were part of a group. And mm. so, so there's, a, there's a way in there for seeing that mm. um, multi, we, I would like to say multicultural rather than multiracial, but whatever, however you want to construe it, mm. um, uh, there is a kind of idea of elites are elites and non-elites are non-elites and we have to stick together in, in, in that way. So he has a way forward, even in the imaginative li literature that he was looking at. So that's, that's really very interesting. Thank you. Um, that's, that's a great point. I'll, I'll take a look at those. Well, um, 
I, I think you've got lots already that you're looking at. So that that's wonderful. Um, anybody else uh, have something they'd like to uh, add here? Um, there's more I think probably could say. Joseph is ready to come back with a, another question. He'll unmute. Um, hi, sorry, I don't want to um, ask too many questions, but since there was no one else in the queue, I thought I'd just jump in. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation about Subhash Chandra Bose um, yeah. and the Indian National Army, and I was really interested in that. And do you write at all about memoirs from that, um, from prisoners from that sort of um, army, um, who obviously, you know, uh, fighting, as it were, on the other side of the kind of global divide in the war? Um, and is it possible to kind of compare the experiences of prisoners and how they write about their kind of affiliations and sense of, sense of intimacy and loyalty with the people who capture that? I don't know, I'm, I'm just, this is a hypothetical, but I'm just wondering like, is that a comparison that's interesting to you? And then I was thinking more broadly and kind of connecting a little bit to um, Sumak's question um, earlier about the sort of Pan-Asianism question mm. is, to what extent was this um, uh, just a job Serving in the serving in the army, f fighting in um, against the Japanese, or uh, serving in Singapore. Like, to what extent was that a job, and to what extent was there a kind of polit a sort of a vision of a political of belonging within within a kind of imperial framework that um, those soldiers kind of accepted? Or mm. um, given given my within my limited understanding of the situation, with the, the Indian National Army perspective is one of is anti-British. Mm. Um, anti-imperialist. Mm. So did the, the people fighting on behalf, as it were, of, of the British Empire, mm. um, but from India, did, how do they see their position within that kind of global conflict and their, how do, where do their affinities lie? Mm. So, Joseph, that's pretty much my project. <laughs> what you, what you, what you said there. That's a really important part of my project, and I would say that really a lot of the memoirs and even novels that I've looked at for my work are haunted by the INA, the Indian National Army. There's always like the specter of the INA um, that's present in, in some form or the other in these, in these forms of writing. And so, so maybe to take your first question, um, answer your first question first, you asked whether there was, whether I was interested in a, an, a comparison between a memoir written by somebody who was in the INA versus somebody who was in the British Indian Army, and yes, I am, and that's um, that forms part of my first chapter when I look at the the political and uh, uh, emotional significance of home and what home meant and the homeland meant. Um, and there's a really interesting memoir by um, um, an INA again, quite elite officer, writing about how writing much later um, in the 70s about how at that moment, even though they lost the war, um, he feels like the they won symbolically because they put up this military resistance to the great British empire. Um, and, and they were in fact in 1946, the INA uh, uh, were seen as this, were heralded across the country as this symbol of, of freedom and independence. And there was this big um, uh, trial in court where three of the INA members, because they had defected, from the British Indian Army were being tried and it had to be, uh, the sentences had to be commuted because of the strength of public support for them. So there's very much a sense in the INA of, of sadness in the loss, but also a sense of, you know, um, being an important symbol, symbol of anti-colonialism. That obviously doesn't exist in the same way uh, in the memoirs written by British Indian um, Army uh, men. But I would say that they're, they're not as, as politically different as you might think. Often you would find quite strong anti-colonial, uh, even anti-British sentiment in the memoirs written by men in the British Indian Army. So they are very conflicted. And I would say it's, it's very difficult to pin them under one group. Um, they're very conflicted because I've looked at some of the statistics and nearly a third of say uh, Indian officers who were in the British Indian Army in the Second World War had a member of their family or friends circle who was an active nationalist. So they were very much in, in kind of um, in tandem with nationalist um, workings, with nationalist emotion, with anti-colonial sentiment. And then for whatever reason, and often those reasons were wildly different, they chose to they chose to fight for the British. 
But I think fighting for the British did not mean, mean that they supported colonialism. And that's the kind of uh, the richness and beauty of the writing that comes through. They're, they're kind of quite conflicted political positions and emotional responses. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. We're getting towards uh, uh, four o'clock and I'm sure that many people are eager to uh, get off and have a little bit of a break. Um, we're going to be back. We'll thank the Dia very much and Yasmina for wonderful papers today that uh, really sparked a lot of great ideas. So thank you very much about that. And uh, um, for, for being the kind of end before our, our uh, little mini break. When we come back on the 14th of April, um, we'll have two more speakers. Uh, Damien Clavel will be talking about the end of the middle ground, Robert Southey's Madoc, uh, British B business imperialism, and uh, the disappearance of American indigenous peoples from the London money market between 1807 and 1825. And then Cole Murphy will be talking about protectionism, deindustrialization, and European integration the crisis of British Keynesianism since the 1970s. So we'll be going down a bit more of an economic path, I think at that seminar. And, uh, but we love the cultural stuff and uh, social history that we heard today. And I'm sure we're eager to hear more about both the projects that uh, Dia and Yasmina are pursuing down the line. So thank you everybody for coming and um, we'll uh, see you on the 14th of April. Have a nice, uh, Easter or whatever break you're going to be taking. Thanks. <laughs>